some effects that we're seeing in, nor in Northwestern Canada. Um, and as an introduction, you know, we are all here. Uh, we love trees. Uh, we love forests. Uh, we look after the forest sector for recreational purposes. Uh, the commercial boreal forest is very important to the economy of Canada, the economy of Ontario. Uh, so um, uh, we have these shared values in this room and in the people in the audience online. And um, we, we cover for each other. And uh, Dan can't be here, so Trish covers for Dan. Uh, Krista can't be here, Chris covers for Krista. Uh, the rest of the Canadian Forest Service can't be here, and I'm covering for them. I'm going to tell you about some things that I was observing um, uh, from 2005 to 2015 when I was working in, uh, in Edmonton Northern Forestry Center. The talk is Welcome to the Anthropocene. This is about big change, big change that's happening in the north and big change that's happening in the south, which Tracy Cook talked about, all the invasives coming up under climate change in um, the U.S. and into southern Canada. But so the Anthropocene is going to be a time of tremendous change. And we've been seeing some things in the Northwest that I want to share with you. Now, these images have been shared eight other times, kind of internally in small meetings, um, and uh, and 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 so. But you haven't seen them, so it's important for people to see what's going on in the far Northwest, because there's not a lot of people up there. We don't have a lot of forest health monitoring up there. They have a minuscule budget, and uh, we've been seeing some scary stuff. So, and the reason is because, as this map shows, the uh, northwestern Canada is the place where climate is changing fastest. So, Canary in the coal mine, this is where we expect to see some, some changes in force uh, earliest. And I am giving this talk here in this forum because Jeff said, well, you know, maybe forest health monitors should know about the kinds of things that are happening. Some of them are only relevant to the north, but many of them would be relevant to the boreal uh, forest region in Ontario and, and beyond. But this is kind of a summary poster that was put together. And I'm sorry for you guys in the audience here, you know, this, the slides are shrunken down in size now. If you all come up here and look at this screen, they're the right size here. So, um, That's much better. That's much better. So, you know, this is um, a survey of, of, uh, of the northwestern region. And uh, my forest health technician uh, uh, at the time, from, from about 2008 to 2012, was Roger Brett. And he was flying over the north taking these photos of all these kind of, um, you know, anomalies. In 2012, we thought they were anomalies. In 2013, we thought they, they were growing anomalies. And they just got bigger and bigger and worse and worse. And we realized, you know, but by, 20, by 2013, Roger would bring back his, his photos, his maps, and would show them to me. And, and, and you know, one time, I, you know, two of the forest health techs were in the office, and they were, like, looking at each other, and like, uh, you know, what are we going to tell Barry? Like, this looks kind of, uh, and I'm like, hey, guys, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, we're just seeing some stuff. And um, so when they showed to me what they were seeing, I was like, oh, wow. Like, I've never been north of 60, guys. So, uh, and I don't work on forest health, for, uh, climate change impacts on, on forests. I'm a specialist in mount pine beetle, forest tank caterpillar, and spruce bugworm, not uh, the effect of weather and, and drought and, and flooding on forests. I don't know anything about this, but we do have people in Atlantic Canada, in Quebec, in the Laurentian Lab, and in the Pacific Lab who know a lot about this, and they're my friends, so we talk, and, we're, and we start talking about this. NASA comes up and visits Edmonton and says, hey, you know, we're seeing some weird things in the north. Would you like to work with us on a research project? We're like, yeah, we're seeing some big weird stuff too, and that's what I want to show you. Um, you know, it's warming a lot in the northwest, and it doesn't matter if you look at time series of temperatures at, at Fort Smith or you map climate moisture index, which is the balance between precipitation and evapotranspiration at Jasper, and things are getting warmer and things are getting drier everywhere in the north. So I'm going to show you about 20 pictures, it won't take very long, of, uh, of all the kinds of different symptoms and signs that we're seeing. And it will give you a sense for the scale of the things that we're seeing. Uh, so, you know, black spruce decline, uh, just dying black spruce over very, very large areas. It's kind of an unbroken landscape where that's underdeveloped. There's no commercial forestry in much of this area in the northwest. 
but we're seeing a large-scale mortality of, uh, of and uh, large-scale mortality of black spruce from uh, permafrost perma melt and uh, water table rise and flooding. So it's flooding out black spruce and associated with the melting permafrost and the dying black spruce are a drunken tree syndrome where the trees are falling over from the melting permafrost. As I go through the slides, what you'll notice, Barry, how many hectares is, is covered by this? Where is this located? You know what? And how do you know that it's melting permafrost? Don't ask me those questions, okay? Because I don't know. Because this is not a science talk. This is a photo essay. Um, I'm a scientist. You guys know what I work on. You know I don't work on this stuff. But we're seeing this, these symptoms all over this large landscape, and we're thinking, well, we better do some science to figure out what's going on and to figure out if, if this is a canary in the coal mine and is this going to start creeping into the uh, commercial boreal forest. You know, uh, it, we need to do some science to get a handle on this. And basically, we do not have a science program on the Northwestern Forest Change. It's an area that's under-monitored and understudied. NASA knows that. They have the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment to look at change in the far north. But, you know, you guys are talking about emerald ash borer and, um, and a, 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 a beech leaf disease. You know how difficult it is to get money to do research, to run programs. As climate changes, we're being overwhelmed. I mean, it's, it's, it's shocking and it's, it's anxiety-inducing. It's wave after wave after wave of problems. In, in the forest today, and it personally uh, 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 causes me anxiety. And I feel, I feel it from coast to coast. I feel it from all of my friends and collaborators who work on emerald ash borer or beech leaf disease or, you know, you name your pest. Uh, for every tree, there's a problem associated with it, and this thing doesn't get any better under climate warming. So that's the kind of overall context. That's why I'm talking about something I actually don't know a whole lot about, but it causes me tremendous anxiety. And my forest health technician comes to me with pictures of large-scale damage. Oh, here's some flooding. Here's aspen that's dying. Here's aspen that's falling over. So it's not just the conifers, it's the hardwoods. What do I say to my technician? Oh, well, what are you going to do? Like, he's carrying this load. He's, seen, he's been mapping since the 1980s. Uh, and he's like, I've never seen this much flooding. I've never seen this much land slumping. I've never seen all species uh, conifers and hardwoods dying at the scale that we're seeing that we're seeing them dying. Um, the uh, uh, this is a photo of, of land slumping. So you know you've got flooding in the flats where the permafrost is melting, but then on any anything that's a slope, it's unstable. So the soil slumps, and then the, the trees go down go down in a landslide. And uh, sometimes Roger, I don't have a pointer, you know, but uh, sometimes Roger will be well. He's mapping all of this stuff. And with each photo, you'll see a little inset where, oh, we saw this over 10,000 hectares. Oh, we saw 5,000 hectares. Oh, we saw a million hectares of this. So, you know, it's kind of mapped, but it's not a coherent atlas of here's what's happening in the Northwest. Um, it's, and it's, it's um, multiple factors creating complex syndromes. So we're seeing drought stress on the foliage of everything from larch to aspen to alder, uh, black spruce, um, uh, uh, birch trees, willow blotch leaf miners, all kinds of things that are typically innocuous and, oh, you get a little spot here, 500 hectares over here, we've got 50 hectares over there, yeah, but we're seeing, oh, no, there were, you know, how many millions of hectares of willow blotch leaf miner in the Mackenzie Valley? It was a monstrous outbreak. I've never seen anything that big. Not even during the spruce budworm years do we get outbreaks as big as that willow blotch leaf miner in the northwest. Um, it's not just black spruce. White spruce are flooding out and, and dying. We're seeing red belting over large areas, um, uh, all species, all locations. You know, you can see multiple locations here, Slave River, Norman Wells, uh, um, uh, one from Scotty Creek. I don't go in the north. I see this and I'm like, Roger, what the heck is going on up there? Spruce budworm, that's a historical distribution map on the right of spruce budworm, and there's a little line there. I'm going to go up to the map and just point it out. in the Mackenzie Valley, and um, so Roger went up and got some insects from that location and put them in rearing here at the insect production facility, and John Wells studying them, and Amanda Rose doing the genetics, uh, genomic scans of these populations to see how distinct they are. Uh, these are do these things have a phenology that, 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 that spruce butterworm could adapt to black spruce? They certainly have a different phenology up there. 
they uh, emerge very late and they blast through the fourth end star. So they're, they're very different phenologically from, from all of the other spruce buttermilk in Canada. You know, uh, is this going to be a, a, a major thing? Is spruce butterworm going to make a switch on the black spruce? This is something that they talk about at Laurentian, but here's a population that has all the features necessary, you know, with that, the plasticity in the species range to adapt to black spruce. Will it? Well, when that popped up in 2015 was the first time we saw that, and we're like, what the heck is spruce butterworm doing in the McKenzie Delta? Um, this, is, this is so small, I can't really read the text on here, but... Uh, um, Lots of different examples of uh, uh, climate-related impacts. Um, these are all. This is a pest shot. So name your species. Doesn't matter if it's spruce or uh, a, a birch. And name your species. There's a defoliator that is, or uh, or a sawfly that is exhibiting. Uh, you know, we we seem to do small amounts of activity over the 80s and 90s. We've never seen them all emerge synchronously. In, 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 at outbreak scales. All of them are, are erupting simultaneously. Um, we started seeing, in 2015, we started getting quite anxious about this. We, we'd seen the images come in from 2012, 2013, 2014. By 2015, we said, well, we don't have any money, but we've, we've got to do something. Uh, let's at least go to Jasper and get some, some tree ring data so we can look at growth, growth ring patterns. And there'd been an analyses going on in the commercial boreal with our friends in, at the Pacific Forestry Center, Werner Kurtz, Rob, his uh, PhD student, Robbie Hember, and at Laurentian, people like Pierre Fernier and Sylvie Gauthier, uh, Martin Girardin, and Boulanger, and they've done papers together, and they published some really wild stuff in um, Science in 2015, a, a great series saying, you know what, climate change is going to be a threat to the boreal forest. Now, that paper came out in a writ period, and they couldn't get approval to speak to their own research, uh, which was kind of disturbing. Uh, we didn't have any money to do any series sampling, so Ted Hogg goes out to Jasper, gets some tree ring data, and the tree rings show exactly what the climate's doing. As the climate drives, the cyan graph on the left, uh, growth rates in, um, in, uh, in uh, Aspen on the top and in spruce on the bottom, they're doing the same thing. The growth rates had peaked 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we, and we used to think, you know, coastal areas could actually benefit from some climate warming. We couldn't be, it might not be a bad thing. Well, that was true in the 80s and the 90s, but we kind of, we flipped the switch. You can see around, uh, somewhere around 2002, 2006, 2008, depends when, when the drought. drought hits, but then we're getting drought after drought after drought after drought. So you see four in a row in both Aspen and Spruce showing up, and so you're getting, not only do you have the overall trend of declining growth, but you have these bang, serious growth reductions um, in, in, in specific drought years. This is a pattern um, that has been reported kind of, early warning signs from the, from the uh, commercial boreal, but in the north, we're seeing really scary signs of large-scale change. Now, as early as, uh, as 2008, we were thinking, well, we'll set up some permanent plots in, in Jasper, and we'll watch the mountain pine beetle as it trickles in, and, uh, and, uh, and, and when, the, when the climate changes in Jasper, you know, kind of 10 and 15 years from now, we'll have all the pre-outbreak data, and then, you know, and then uh, we'll, uh, and then we'll have the post-outbreak data. So it's a great opportunity to set up kind of a lab, and we get to spend our summers in Jasper National Park. What could be better? But uh, the outbreak started in about, as soon as we said it, it was like the Beatles were like, okay, let's get going. Let's go. Let's see if we can beat the researchers. Uh, so, you know, Jasper National Park now, uh, a good portion of the pine now has been consumed, and it started, he's got the time series here. You can see him, he's put it in a larger and larger font. Uh, now we're in 2018, um, several hundred thousand hectares in Jasper, um, all of the pine that's at the elevation that pine beetles can consume it, it's con been consumed. The beetles are pouring out of the park now into Hinton District, where beetles have not been historically uh, present. And beetles historically uh, had occurred at very small levels in Banff and Jasper, individual clusters, but we've never seen an outbreak of this magnitude in Jasper National Park. Um, but we knew this was coming. This is the amazing thing about CFS science. We knew this was coming. We're Let's, if we got some money, we'll set up there, we'll watch this thing come, and we'll be able to tell this great story about the, the wave that, that rolled over us. But it erupted so fast and, 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 and blew up so quickly, um, there, and there's nothing that can be done in a situation like that. There's so many red trees affected. It's so far removed from, you know, uh, there's so much of it. Uh, it's inaccessible. It's an unmanageable situation. All you can do is adapt to what nature throws at you. Um, 
Of course, it's not just insects and the direct impacts of weather effects. And uh, you, you have uh, root diseases are exploding. Uh, but the scale, of, this is one map that I did like because the, uh, uh, so I mean it uh, larger, the scale of balsam fir mortality is really impressive. There's a lot of balsam fir mortality from our malaria. And now it's our malaria, but you know, climate change work from Mike Cruikshank in, in Pacific Forestry Center says, a little bit of climate warming, and Todd Ramsfield at Northern Forestry Center, he knows this too, a little bit of climate warming is all you need for our malaria to go crazy. It's going crazy. Um, so that's kind of the northern story, but the alpine is no better. Every single species that you can name that's in Jasper National Park or, or Banff or Waterton and all these different um, National Rocky Mountain Parks, all those species are all declining. Um, they're exposed on gravelly soils, shallow soils, slopes, southern slopes. So we're getting ribbons of mortality on the exposed slopes, every species. Uh, aspen, alder, birch on the hardwood side, any hardwood, you can, any softwood you can name, uh, uh, from, from Douglas fir to uh, uh, white spruce, um, balsam fir, everything. It's all declining. Um, we don't have maps of all these, uh, of all these, well, we, we have, we have maps, uh, yearly maps, but they are not pu pulled together in a systematic manner in a coherent database where you could analyze you know, spatial temporal patterns and say, oh, what are the critical thermal thresholds that are being crossed, and how bad is this gonna bet get, and how many years before we start seeing this in northern Ontario or northern Quebec? You know, it'd be nice to have a science program that looks at that, but I'm here now, I'm in Ontario, I'm focused on things like spruce budworm and jack pine budworm, but this is what's happening in the northwest. Um, and so this is a photo of all the different uh, symptoms that were talked about today about uh, needle rusts and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, other leaf, uh, leaf diseases, browning of balsam fir, browning of, of different uh, conifers. We're seeing a lot of this. Uh, photos from the different landscape photos from the different Waterton, uh, Waterton lakes and Jasper. There's, there's a lot of conifers that are dying back in hardwoods too. And so I come back to the poster that um, Roger, Brett, and Jacob Olszewski put together to show, you know, even though these are cherry-picked snapshots, oh, we're seeing a little bit of this here, a little bit of that there. You, start, you put it together, and it makes it makes a pretty impressive photo essay. This is not science. This is uh, this is for health porn, I guess. <laughs> Summary. This is here's our here's our here's my model. The Goldilocks model. In the center, you know, where the soil is, uh, the air is moist, the soil is fresh, it's well drained, trees like it. If it's too, if it's too warm or dry, that's no good. If it's too wet, that's no good. So Goldilocks. You know, what's happening in the north is under climate change. You're, you're taking these these formerly uh, habitable habitats, redundancies, and then you, you're, you're forcing them into one of the two extremes. It's either too dry or it's too wet. So the forest in the northwest is being squeezed on both ends. So it's not any one effect, it's a whole bunch of effects. Um, and very briefly, I'll probably close here. You know, there's a lot of stuff online. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of papers being published too that talk about the greening planet. Remote sensing papers to take a picture of the planet Earth and it looks green. And it's true that when you look at, you know, Landsat data from 1980s to 2000s, the planet is greening, hooray. Yeah, you know, it's greening. Is it greening from CO2 concentrations? Well, you know, plants aren't really limited by the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. You know, 280, 300 ppm is good enough for a plant. You don't need 500 for a plant. Plants are largely nitrogen limited. So until you add a whole bunch of nitrogen, they can't really use the extra carbon. And we learned that from the, from the free air carbon enrichment experiments, the face experiments done by the uh, uh, U.S. and many Canadians collaborated on these things. So, you know, Carbon, CO2, greening the planet, no, you know, that's, that's not what's happening. Um, the greening planet is happening for a couple of reasons, right? As climate warms, alpine tree levels are, uh, the, uh, the tree line is rising in the alpine conditions. That's partly a function of fire suppression, and we've known this since the 70s, 80s, you know, alpine meadows are filling in with conifers because we don't suppress fires anymore. So that's a big part of the greening response in alpine areas. In, 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 in large parts of the, uh, 
in the, the Amazon, and even in Canada, you know, we have the amount of area that used to be farmed in the 1920s and 1950s in, in northern Quebec, it's all greening, meaning from, from, from white or high reflectance, because these are satellites, going from high reflectance to looking darker and greener. Um, so we're getting a lot of aspen coming into farm fields, taking over the fields, and we're supposed to celebrate, oh, the, well, the greening planet. You know, the, 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 the aspen in the farm fields are going to save us. It's a sign that everything's okay. The planet's greening. Uh, it's all from CO2. And now those trees are going to sink all the carbon. Like, the carbon sinks that are out there are in big trouble. They're in the northwest, they're in trouble. The fires in British Columbia, the invasives in southern Canada, our, our forest carbon sinks um, require some evaluation as to their long-term durability in terms of their ability to, to sink carbon for the, for the benefit of the planet. So the, this cartoon is an attempt to explain in a snapshot how is it that we're getting such significant browning in the north, but the planet's greening. Yeah, the planet's greening on average, or when you look at a Landsat cell that's, you know, 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers, oh, it's greener than it was in 1970. Yeah, you're getting a lot of greening from the side, and you're getting a lot of browning from above, and the browning's happening in particular areas that are, that are more sensitive than other areas. In a short snapshot, the planet's greening, but in the long run, what's happening to the tall trees matters quite a bit. Um, that's all I wanted to say. This is probably the shortest talk I've ever given. Where's Chris? I want. <laughs> That's probably the first talk I've ever given. I just wanted to show you some some northwestern forest health decline porn. It's really depressing, and I hope you're not depressed. You know, we're all here to do good things, do the right things. My concluding statement is, you know, God love you all because we don't have the budget to monitor everything and can treat everything. What's happening under climate change is transformational. It's not a good news story, and. Uh, you know, I hear the frustration in everybody's voices, and I'm, I'm projecting it now. I'm capturing it. I'm projecting it. The frustration associated with, uh, oh, you know, CFIA is past the buck. CFIA is not doing this for invasives. The Ameri Look at all the invasives that come into the U.S., come into Canada. Canada's got to point the finger at the U.S. You know, this is not an easy situation that we're dealing with. So you should all be given credit for putting up with this. I don't know. If, I've only been in this business for for 15, 17 years, and, uh, you know, I've seen too much. I've seen enough. I don't know how you guys who've been in the field for 30, 35 years, I don't know how you do it because the change we're looking at is, um, is significant.